estoy, estoy muy encantado de estar aquí para hacer esta presentación eh, acerca de mi investigación en modelos de empresa. Eh, y como estos cambian eh, a lo largo del tiempo, eh, ahora les voy a hablar en inglés porque la presentación está en inglés de mi capacidad de expresión en español es muy limitada. Um, entonces, si estoy hablando muy, muy rápido, me digan algo, por favor. Uh, muchas gracias. Um, so, this uh, will start with the title. Um, so, this is business model change. Uh, in early stage entrepreneurial firms facing high uncertainty. The title looks uh, very, a little complex and long, but it's just about how the business model changes over time in companies that are starting up uh, and they are at a, their early stage and we will see what that means. And also firms that are in environments that are changing very rapidly and the, these environ, environments are very uncertain. So, starting with the, oops, starting with change. Uh, so change uh, is nothing new. Uh, change is always, has always been present uh, in our lives for a long time ago. And we have a Greek philosopher saying, for example, 500 years before uh, Christ, that uh, change, in fact, is constant. Um, we also have, um, regarding uncertainty, even in the harder, in the hard si side of science, like physics and engineering, in which things are so certain, there is also uncertainty. And if some of you know physics or has studied, probably you've heard about the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that you cannot know simultaneously with accuracy um, both the position and the speed of a particle. Uh, so this was in 1927. So a long time ago, there was already uncertainty. Change and uncertainty are normal things. And then I have heard about this Heineken uncertainty principle, which I thought it was very interesting. Uh, this inability to know how many beers people have, for example, last night. So uh, even here you have uncertainty. So there is uncertainty in everyday life. And because things change, you have to react to adapt to changes. And there is also a very old law that says to every action that is always a reaction. Um, does the need to adapt. Let me just tell you that this is a, a presentation about a, a PhD research. And I know this might be quite heavy, uh, especially after lunch. And uh, my big challenge here is make sure that you don't fall asleep. Um, so I'll try very, very hard that that doesn't happen. Um, uh, so, why are business models important? Um, for some reasons. Because um, the performance of your company is not only related uh, to the technology you have to offer. Uh, the business model plays an important role in this. So, performance of entrepreneurial firms is strongly conditioned by their adopted business model. Uh, it was not me who said that many, many people have said. Um, also, new companies in environments that are highly unstable and turbulent, uh, they have to change their, their business models several times to succeed, so they have to be flexible. And also, uh, the way you design the business model uh, is especially critical uh, when we're talking about research-based companies like university spin-offs or technology-based So, um, why did, did I decide to study uh, this? Uh, 
because uh, um, I saw there was a gap because most of business model research uh, was carried out uh, with a static perspective. So most of the research in business models look at the business model at a certain point in time and don't follow the evolution of that business model. Some studies have looked at the evolution of business models, but they have looked from here to the past. And this is like a, a retrospective approach in which you ask people to tell their stories of how it happened. This has a lot of biases. Um, and because people tend to tell a nicer story. And sometimes because of the success, they forget uh, the hard parts, etc. So I thought it would be interesting to follow uh, these companies. Uh, longitudinal, in, in real time. So I went to these companies and uh, I asked them every month, how is your business model now? So I track them in real time. So few studies have examined real-time change or employed longitudinal design, that's what I meant. And few studies have also investigated the connection between how the business model changes and if that has some implications on the performance of these firms. So again, this study is, uh, employs a longitudinal design. Longitudinal means a long time, okay, over time, to capture changes in business model elements. Uh, and the research questions uh, that, that I wanted to answer uh, are, are the following. So how does the process of business model change uh, occur in early stage entrepreneurial firms? And how does this process of change link to performance? So uh, this, this uh, first part is, is probably a bit heavier because it has to do with the, the methodology uh, behind the study. Uh, though I think it's interesting if, if any of you might want in the future to do some research, um, this is more or less a traditional way that you can present it. Start with a, with a research gap, research, research questions, and then you go into the methodology and definitions. And, and then in the end, to the, to the results, to the findings. Um, so, I adopt this definition of business model. Uh, and it was kind of a blend of other definitions. Uh, definitions by Zot and Amit, by Oster Waller, which uh, you've heard uh, with Bob Dorf's uh, presentation, and, and, and Zot again. So a business model is a system of interdependent elements if we, if we look at the business model canvas from Osterwalder that uh, Mr. Uh, Bob Dort talked uh, about previously this morning, it has nine elements. Uh, these elements are customer facing. We have customers, we have customer relationships, and we have channels. So this is like the demand side of your business. And that is the supply side of the business. Testing. Can you hear me well? Yes? Okay, thank you. So, um, again, as I was saying, this model, this uh, business model canvas from Osterwald has nine elements. Some of these elements are facing the customer, facing the demand. Okay? Customers, uh, customer relationships and channels. 
others are facing the supply side, like key partners, the key partners which can be, for example, your supply chain, etc. And, and here is the, the money line, so revenues and costs. And uh, what, what, the, what the definition is saying is that, is that the business model is a system of interdependent elements. So these elements communicate with each other and depend upon each other so that one change in one ma element might trigger changes in other elements. Okay, so it's a system. Um, and um, it's a, a system of interdependent elements that model how an organization creates, uh, delivers, and captures value also encompassing activities that transcend the popular organization boundaries. Let me um, translate a bit this. Uh, uh, so it, it means that it also looks at activities that are outside of your company's domain or boundaries, because when you're talking about customers, these are outside your domains, your boundaries, and also partners, okay? So the business model looks not only to your company, but also to things that are surrounding you. Um, so, just to finish with the methodology, this is an inductive study, so we're coming from data and try to generate theory, not to test theory, so it's from, from the empirical data to theory. And it's uh, longitudinal, which means over time, and multiple case study means that it's not only one study, one study it's various, uh, various cases, not only one. So what was the sample that was used? It were, uh, so I used eight university spin-offs, so companies that spun out of the university. Um, and these eight spin-offs were from the same uh, university which means that um, this has advantages and disadvantages. Uh, the fact that it's from the same university means that they all receive kind of an equal support from the university, from the technology transfer office. So it means that we're, we are going to look only in variations um, uh, and we are controlling for the university policy, okay? Um, the companies are early stage, which means uh, they have less than 3.5 years, uh, according to the Global Entrepreneurship Monitor uh, definition. They are younger than 3.5 years. And, um, okay, why did I select uh, these companies and not other companies? If you remember, in the, in the beginning, uh, we were talking about investigating the link between business model change and performance. Okay. So it would be nice to have uh, companies that will go, uh, will perform well and companies that will perform not so well. So we can compare them and see if there are any patterns. Uh, but because I'm following them in real time and not retrospectively, uh, I don't know if they will perform well or not um, I have to wait. So I select them based on predictors of performance. So I went back to the literature, to the books and articles, and, um, and I came up with the certain measures that they are good predictors of performance. And such ma measures are market experience, knowledge, uh, 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 managerial knowledge, and entrepreneurial knowledge. So I tried to select companies that were high in these indicators and low as well. So I don't know if everyone can see this, uh, this table back there. Is it, can you see it? More or less. Okay. So this is the, the cohort or the, 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 the eight companies that we're talking about. Um, for confidentiality reasons, uh, I cannot give the, the name, but uh, at least we have some uh, data industry, for example. Uh, you see some are electronics, uh, two here in electronics, semiconductors, biotech, 
biopharmaceutical, again, electronics and software, energy, and another biotech. So um, there is quite an interesting mix here. And as you can see, we have from one employee till 26 employees, so also different sizes. Um, so these are the number of interviews that I did to each, uh, to each of these companies. So I followed these companies during 12 months and I interviewed them monthly. And in the end, I interviewed another informant, so another person, uh, just to make sure, uh, to see if they agree with each other. It's called data tri triangulation, it's kind of a technique to ensure that your research is, is, is rigorous. So, um, this is the date of incorporation of the companies, and this is the date when they started normal operations, when they started really working. Uh, so, how, how do you collect uh, the data to, to then come up with something? So, I did an initial interview uh, to each of these founders of the eight companies, and uh, I asked for generic, uh, uh, generic firm data, generic indicators. Uh, then I did 12 months of longitudinal interviews, again, to review them every month. And then, in the end, uh, I went there with some, with some, uh, um, with an Excel file with many indicators, and we were filling in the indicators, and these indicators uh, have to do with performance. Uh, also did the retrospective interviews with other informants. I also gathered archival data from internal sources. This is like websites um, and presentations that these CEOs did, etc. And archival data from external sources, which means news, for example. Just, I know this is quite uh, heavy and maybe boring, but I, I just wanted to have an idea of what are we talking here about in terms of data. So you have three blocks. This is interviews, this is internal sources, this is external sources. And uh, here, in the end, this is the number of pages. So 981 pages of interviews to process. Um, and in terms of internal sources, you know, we're talking about more or less 2,600 pages of information. And this is a lot of information and most of this longitudinal multiple case studies have a, a lot of information and the problem is what do you do with this? You know, what, how can you approach such a big amount of data? So, usually what you do in these cases is you start by reducing, reducing data, okay? If you go to the news, sometimes they repeat themselves. Even the entrepreneurs, when they are speaking, sometimes they are repeating themselves. And in the, in the next meeting, they will tell me something that they already told me in the other meeting. So you can somehow eliminate this duplication. So this is data reduction. That's how it is called, sorry. Uh, and then I did tables to synthesize the information, to organize it in an easier way to look at it. And then, uh, chronological sequence of key events. W what happens is that many times um, the entrepreneurs are talking and then they talk about the past and then they talk about their intentions to the future and then they go back again and if you look at, at the interviews it's sometimes a, a real mess and you have to organize this chronologically so that's what it means. Um, then I did business model maps describing changes. You know that Osterwalder framework of nine elements, I did this for each company for each month and looked at the changes. And then we do something called coding, annotating and memory, which means looking at the interviews, for example, and looking for specific teams. For example, 
customer development or uh, looking to attract investors. Uh, so these are little codes that you, that's how you start analyzing the data, by coding and annotating if some thoughts uh, arise in your head. Uh, then I use some indicators to assess firm performance and such data for patterns uh, and induced profits. Uh, so these are just uh, some measures that were used, market knowledge, managerial knowledge, and knowledge, the commitments of the entrepreneur, uh, how, how is he, you know, is, is he working full-time or part-time in the business? Firm performance, uh, for example, company value, uh, many of these companies, when they want to attract investors, somehow they have to make financial projections, like uh, Bob was saying uh, in the morning. Uh, though these projections are not accurate and many times misleading, uh, they are done and that's how they, they, they evaluate the company. Then uh, sales, number of employees, etc., and many other indicators. So, I, I just showed you the research gap, uh, some definitions, the methodology. Uh, I can see that a few of you are already sleeping, which I thought it would be, you know, it would be predictable. So uh, now, for those who are sleeping, I ask you please stay with me for the findings. Um, and so, let's go to the findings. First, um, w when I was talking with the entrepreneurs, many times they were talking about their intentions to the future, towards the future, rather than reality. So they were saying, Yes, we will sell to these customer segments and to this one. So to, we have three customer segments. Uh, but I ask, but did you sell to them already? They will tell me, no, I didn't sell yet, but I intend to. So, uh, but some customer segments they already sold to. So there's a bit of a, a mess here when I was gathering data because Will I, will I, you know, will I look at how the, the, the intended business model changes in their minds? Or do I look at the real, the actual business model? So there are these two different business models. One that is in the entrepreneur's mind and is some sort of projection, some sort of plan he has to the future. And another is the, the real business model which is happening now. This is not new. Uh, I don't know if you had um, some lectures on strategy or strategic management, but uh, Mintzberg talked a lot about uh, um, back in 78, so quite a 34 years ago. Uh, <coughs> he was talking already about um, intended strategies and realized strategies and also emergent strategies, which were these ones that you were not predicting and they happened something changed or you met someone along the way or you decided to marry and just left for the business I don't know so just uh, things that happen that you cannot predict is not in your plan so we have this realized and intended business models uh, at, at a certain point in time I decided to, to capture both so this study has both business models intentions and realities also uh, I found that there is a quite a good balance between what they call serendipity, which, which is linked with um, unpredictability. So, changes are occurring according to, uh, to your plan, but there are also changes occurring uh, which you didn't predict beforehand. Okay? So, there's kind of a balance between both. Uh, this is interesting because there's a big debate uh, in entrepreneurship and in strategic management whether things are planned, whether things are not planned and emergent and what we see here is it's both. Okay, so it's like the entrepreneurs have a prepared mind, they have a plan but 
they are flexible to cope with uncertain environments, okay, with environments with, with higher uncertainty. Um, so this is um, this is a table which which shows us, um, and again I don't know if in the back you can see it, um, but I'll try to to just give you an idea of what this table uh, contains. So. It has commitment here, market knowledge, managerial knowledge, entrepreneurial knowledge, and relative performance. Um, as you can see, it's interesting because here we have this case, case A, in which the entrepreneur is 50% committed to the spin-off and other 50% of the time is doing something else, uh, maybe research because he's an academic. All the others are 100% dedicated to the spin-off. So we have to treat this case as, a, as an exceptional case. Uh, and, and so what we learn from here is, if you look, these are the business model changes. These are the different elements here. Customer segments, value proposition, channels, customer relationships, revenue streams, key resources, key activities, key partnerships, and cost structure. So this is also the business model. Thing. And these are the number of changes in the realized business model and in the intended business model that's in their heads, which is changing as well over time. So, what we learn from this case is that somehow it looks like looking at the number of changes here, it looks like uh, when you have less commitment, there are less changes in the business model. This makes sense uh, because it's like uh, if, you don't, if you don't practice a sport, you don't see it evolving somehow. So you have to have commitment in order for things to progress. Um, back here, in this side, we also have an exceptional case. This is a company, uh, uh, a biotechnology company that makes um, so uh, diagnostic kits to, to test uh, food to see if the food is clean or not. And, um, and this company it, it was, um, like all the others, a research-based company. Um, they, so they had, uh, um, they did the research and they were developing and, and testing the product, but they didn't have a way of selling and distributing their products. And they could do that by a sort of partnership or building their own sales team, uh, their own distribution channels. But they, they saw an opportunity to buy, to acquire uh, a company uh, and they acquired the company by giving them some shares in exchange for shares in their company. So uh, they acquired a company which was a sales distribution, sales and marketing company. So with that acquisition, they became a kind of a complete, a whole organization from research to product development to distribution, sales and marketing. So they became a whole organization by acquisition, okay? And that's why there are so many business model changes. Because suddenly, when you have a company and you buy another company, uh, which has a, a slightly different business model, and you blend both, instantly there are many changes occurring in the business model. And that's what happened. All these changes were the consequence of the, um, the restructuring of this company. Uh, the other six companies, if you look here, you see there are two that are low performing, other two that are moderate, and other two that are high performing companies. Um, and also there's a good mix between market knowledge, entrepreneurial knowledge, and managerial knowledge. So uh, there's a good mix here. Um, so some of the findings, this was what, what I was telling you. Um, the higher the commitment, 
So the more committed you are, uh, more dedicated, uh, more time dedicated to the company. Uh, so you will see uh, a, a, a faster uh, process of change. Okay. Um, I sometimes look at this like uh, you studied maths, numerical analysis, or, or something like that. You have a, 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 a function, and then you are trying to reach the, the optimum solution. Uh, imagine that the optimum solution is your business model, the, the one that is viable. So you are iterating, and the speed of iteration is, is higher if you are more committed. Um, also restructuring so if there is restructuring going on like acquisitions or mergers uh, then your business model will obviously change because suddenly you will have different resources maybe different customer sizes maybe different channels okay. um, in terms of knowledge uh, with this cohort of eight university spin-offs um, we realize that uh, the higher the market the managerial and the entrepreneurial knowledge uh, the lower the number of changes especially in customer facing elements so what I'm trying to say if you remember the, the Osterwalder framework um, there were some elements that were facing the customer and in these companies uh, where there is higher market and managerial knowledge, it looks like they, they, they change less the customer segments, the channels, and the customer relationships, which means they, they, they have their segments right from the beginning, uh, more or less. Uh, this, this table uh, is a, a table that shows you the changes as you can see, there is a timeline here. Okay, these are the interview dates. And you have uh, from May 2011 till May 2012. And as, as you can see, in this company, the customer segment didn't change. Neither did the value proposition or channel or customer relationships. There's just a slight change in the, inten in the intention. The, the italic, you know, when the letters are like this, it's like the intended business. Intention, um, but if you look at the other key activities, key partners, there is much going on, and things are changing. They are adding partners, etc. Okay. So we didn't talk a lot about uh, performance yet. Um, if you are still awake, then. Uh, uh, I will ask for for your uh, um, for your attention because this this is uh, this is really interesting even in, in practical terms and it's it's very aligned with the, the talk uh, uh, with the previous talk this this morning um, sort of a confirmation somehow um, uh, so. In higher performing firms, the intended business models change less times after firm birth. I'm not saying that being completely static is good, not at all. But in this sample of eight companies, the ones that change less their customer facing elements were the ones who have more, more success. They have higher performance. Now, the problem here is how do we define performance? Uh, I define performance a lot based on growth and company value. But if you want to make a, a, a lifestyle type of business in which you, you want to have a small company, you don't want to grow the company. You want the company to stay small with three or four people. That's fine. And, uh, and in your own metrics, that's uh, a high-performance company. Uh, the thing is that these university spin-offs, 
they want to get investors and they, they in the end many of them want to sell the company they want to be acquired and get a lot of money and go away to, to have some vacations maybe here in Colombia for example so um, um, what I also observed is that um, in, in higher performing companies uh, they told me they had uh, a very intense initial period in which they were uh, testing their intended business model. So the, the business model they were imagining, they were testing it and doing iterations. Uh, so it means that the, the intended business model changed many times before they started the firm. Okay. And uh, also these high performing firms, they interacted earlier and more intensively with, with stakeholders like, uh, like industry analysts, for example, like uh, potential customers. Uh, so it means, it looks like from, from this sample of eight companies, it looks like that interacting earlier and go, going out of the building as, as Bob was saying, uh, it looks like it pays off uh, and uh, they became more successful. So, also, um, in these companies, because I interviewed two, two, peop two people in, in, in each of the companies, the companies that were performing better, the story that each of these persons told me uh, were more, uh, more aligned in high-performing companies. Their perspective of the business model was the same somehow. Um, in in some of the companies, and and here I'll give you some examples uh, because it might help you to, to might help to illustrate uh, illustrate this. For example, th there was a, a a company there. Uh, which does which is in the renewable energy sector and and it uses um, it uses the ti the energy of the tides um, to to uh, to create uh, electricity that they then sell to um, to the grid to the electric grid to the utilities companies and um, since the beginning they were very much focused on tidal uh, energy, uh, so tidal uh, generating energy and making a turbine to, to create energy from, from tides. And they, they knew that they were going to sell it to the utilities companies. So that their customer segment was very focused since the beginning. Um, another company, so this means that they, they, they somehow they define their market very early on. Okay. Um, another company is a company who makes um, collars for cows. Uh, and uh, these collars that cows have, uh, no, the, may, so gives the information to the, to the user uh, or when the cow is ready uh, uh, to, to, to give birth, for example, or when it has more milk, uh, and this kind of stuff. So, um, how, 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 how did this company start? So, this company was based on a research that was demanded. So, uh, it was a, a government, the, the government spotted a gap market gap because there were some farmers that were asking for, for a solution like this. And so the government uh, contacted the research institute uh, at the university. And uh, these researchers went to the farms and started talking with the farmers and they understood what they want. So they started to develop a solution for their problem. 
And this was even before the firm was created. This was still in a research phase. And it was, it, they had money from, a, 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 from the government to do this, for the grant. And so uh, this company was also very well focused since the beginning. So, and uh, this is somehow what uh, people usually call market pool. So it's the market which is pulling somehow the need for a solution, which is different uh, of, for example, if you are in a research institute and you come up with a new idea, a new technology, and you say, hey, I have this new technology, but I don't know, I can apply it to so many contexts. Uh, I don't even know which one to choose. Um, so this is more of a technology push. Uh, these companies tend to take more time to get the right customer segment to start selling to. Um, and what I realized is that um, the market, the companies that started with market pool were more focused on the market since the beginning. And then, then the customer facing element, customer segments, channels, customer relationships, changed much less than in the other com companies. And these companies, actually, they were better performing that, than the others. Also because, you know, in a, in a, in a, in a startup company, you have some sort of resource constraints for a startup, so you don't have, sometimes to keep focus is, is better. Um, and this was the case with this company. Uh, it's interesting how the entrepreneurs talked about this because they were telling me, oh, we have a generic technology, so we can apply it to so many customer segments. And, and this, I feel this is their interpretation. Uh, whereas in, in, uh, in other companies, they have a more, they said they have a more narrow scope technology. But th that might not be the case, this is their interpretation. They just didn't care about the other markets because early on they started very focused on one market. Um, also, another topic that is interesting and uh, comes out of, of this research is what is change? Oh, I, I even went to the, to the dictionaries to uh, look at definitions of change um, because we are talking about business model change, but the, the crucial point here is to measure this change or do I consider this to be a change or not? For example, if I have four key activities occurring in the company and I have a percentage of the time or energy that the entrepreneurs are, are, are putting into these activities. If this activity suddenly changes from 25% of their time to 35% of their time, so the activities are the same, just intensity, the energy that you are putting in the activities is different. So it, is this a change in the business model? So, um, and if it changes from 10 to 90 percent, looks like more significant. So, uh, this is the problem, uh, and it was, uh, I had a hard time. I just consider that if anything changes, and uh, it, it is something that is, that will remain, that is not just, a, you know, something that changes and then goes back to the initial point, then I consider it a change. But uh, I think there's a need for future studies on change uh, to define very well what they consider to be a change and to define which various degrees of change you might have um, in a certain business model. So, uh, a bit of, the, of a discussion uh, now just uh, to finish. Um, the discussion part, uh, I don't know how many of you read the uh, ac academic papers. Uh, usually, in the end, there is some sort of part 
where they link it with theory. And it's probably the part where you skip it and go to the conclusions because it's quite a heavy story. But it's, it's um, well, the theory, theory um, is interesting in some ways. Uh, you have many examples of that. Um, you have, I don't know, Einstein's theory of the relativity that allows you to, to predict many things and you have the, 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 you know, many, many theories in physics and in other well-established uh, domains of science. Entrepreneurship is quite a young field, uh, like management. Entrepreneurship is even younger. So it's quite messy and usually in entrepreneurship you go and get the theories from other fields, from other domains, uh, like psychology, like management, like economics, like strategic management, um, even, even, like, even physics when you're talking about complexity or, or chaos. Or So what I want to tell you is that you know, this is quite uh, a heavy subject for, a, for an afternoon, but uh, uh, it's a necessary discussion um, if you are trying to do something with this. So from looking at, to, at, from looking at, at the, how these companies, how the business models of these companies changed over time, and uh, looking at theories out there, and trying to establish a bridge, um, it looks like the business model is a complex uh, system. So why? Because you have different elements, and one change in one element will have some sort of repercussion, you know, will trigger changes in other elements. They are all connected uh, together. And so it's something with a systemic nature and you cannot cut it in parts and, uh, so there's this behavior of a complex system let's see so the business model is a functional whole consisting of little parts which are the elements that are interdependent it looks like there is some sort of trial and error mechanism here in which you learn by trying and getting feedback from that trial. Okay, so um, this exists as well in many other domains of science. You try, you experiment, it works, so you try again in another situation and it works. So it looks like when you're attempting to get your business model right, uh, you try and you learn with a, with a failure, or you learn with a trial. And it also co-evolves with its environment. So the business model is not something that is isolated from the environment. It will receive inputs from the environment. You know, new competitors that challenge the technology that you have to offer. Um, you know, new people gravitating around your company, new partners, uh, etc. Changes in the, in the environment, like, if, for example, in this um, pharma company, there was uh, an uh, some sort of epidemics going on, and so suddenly the need for this uh, drug uh, increased, and the, 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 the company value increased because of that external trend. Um, also, uh, this looks like a very big buzzword, metastable states, um, but uh, if you imagine that the business model uh, has a certain configuration, and then you are trying and trying, then you get to this configuration. It is metastable, this means it's not stable, because it's not there forever, you'll have to change it. So, um, um, it's temporary, it's metastable, and if there are inputs from the external environment or even from the inside of the system, you'll have to change to other metastable states. Okay. 
And so restructuring, like acquisitions, mergers, etc., and external shocks, like epidemics, changes in trends in the economic environment, etc., this will perturb somehow this metal stable state, and you have to prompt to another state, another configuration that works within this environment. Uh, also, in reality, there, there is not only one business model system, there are two. One which is in your head as an entrepreneur, which is your intention. You know, like for example, like I say, tomorrow I will study for four hours. That's my business model for tomorrow. If I, if I realize it or not, if I do it or not, then I don't know. Uh, but that's my plan. So here you have the intentions, the intended business model, and the realized business model. And one is somehow pulling the other, your intentions are pulling your realization. Okay. Um, this, um, what is this slide? Um, these are the drivers of business model uh, change the things that happen that make the business model change over time. And uh, a big one is the desire to grow. So the, the, the entrepreneurs want to grow the company, to increase its value, uh, uh, because many of them are attempting to sell the business to exit and get a huge amount of money from it, especially in this sort of university uh, So, and this growth can be by increasing sales in existing segments or going to new markets, mostly geographical. This is, if you study the, the strategic management, the, this looks like unsolved matrix, which is quite old already. And, uh, so this is a big driver. When I was asking, so why did the business model change? He said, oh, because we, we are expanding to new markets, so we need new partners. We need investments to attract investors because we need you know, to pay for the travels, to go outside, for meetings, etc. So this triggers uh, a lot of change. Also, because they are uh, small startups, they, they need uh, extra resources and they need financial resources, investment or grant funding, which is better uh, for them. Uh, to do what? To do product development and testing, IP development and, and pay the patents because sometimes patents can be quite expensive in these small businesses and to do normal operations as well. Also, the need for human resources be it for normal operations or because they need scientific or technical expertise or because they, they need management financial expertise or because they need investment expertise to help them to attract uh, more investors. So this means that some, sometimes I will ask them, so why did the did it change? Uh, what changed with this month? He said, oh, the cost structure. So why is that? Because we are paying corporate advisors to help us to get investment. Or because we have a new employee coming on board. So a new employee means a new resource in the company. And, uh, and uh, the increasing costs or, 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 or a new class of costs it means also a change in the, the, in the business model. So this this, is, this sort of things is what is triggering, making change Also, there is a, a lot of things about customers happening. So many times the customer segment changes and the value proposition changes because customers are asking for it. Uh, they sometimes they go to a meeting and uh, I have many examples of of that they go through uh, a business meeting presenting their research and suddenly someone comes and says why, why don't you do this for this market as well? because I think it could work and so they, if they grab this opportunity they have to shape to change a bit the value proposition to adjust to this sort of customer side so this is this customer interaction triggers a lot of changes in the business and uh, they were also approached by large companies for partnership licensing or acquisition. 
there are also other, other things triggering changes, not going to all of them just now, but... Um, so, uh, just to finish um, with, uh, with, with theory, um, um, there's some sort of plurality here, uh, because sometimes we tend to grab just one theory or two, and what, 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 what I, I observed in this study was that there are many theories that fit this data. And for example, when we're talking about growth, there's a number of, of, of theories on growth, both in strategic management or, or economic literature. On the resource constraints, uh, on the resource constraints, we have theories related to, to resources, like the resource-based view in strategic management, or the dynamic capabilities, like this. And they all have a lot to do with what was happening uh, with, with this company. And also, there's a, a huge literature on customer-driven innovation or customer-led innovation, von Hippel and many others uh, in the past. Uh, there are also many, many designations, a lot of terminology to say the same thing. So if you hear customer-driven, customer-centric, customer-led, it's all the same, more or less. So, this also applies to, to, to this particular data. Uh, also restructuring, many theories related to restructuring. And also a lot of theories dealing with uncertainty versus planning. Uh, recently there's the effectuation theory from Sarasvati, which uh, I think it was a 2001 article in the Annual Management Review. Uh, a lot of um, literature in bricolage, uh, which has to do with, uh, you know, we do things with the means that we have in hand, uh, and we are willing to sacrifice goals to adapt the goal a bit because we just have these means. Uh, so, effectuation, bricolage, improvisation are theories that have to do with uncertainty, uncertainty and a more uncertain environment um, versus versus the strategic planning versus literature from strategic management. So, as you can see, um, there are many theories and uh, they all have their, their usefulness in different contexts. And we can see them uh, in spin-offs like in many other, uh, in many other places. So, uh, what are the implications for researchers? There is a contribution here in entrepreneurial strategy literature at a business model level, not the strategy level. Uh, a multiple case study on business model change and some sort of an empirical support on this so-called lean startup movement that, uh, that Bob was talking this morning. Um, and for practitioners, for entrepreneurs, and for policy makers, uh, what are the lessons learned? So, the lessons learned is that entrepreneurs should uh, perform iterative testing on their intended business models before starting up. It's much better if you do this test in your intended business model before you start up, before you start having to pay things and spend money. Um, so, this approach is much more cost effective because uh, because you are not going, to, your mistakes will cost you less if you do these iterations in your mind. Okay, you won't burn much money trying things. Also, the early involvement of stakeholders, stakeholders are uh, people around, uh, like customers, potential customers, uh, industry experts, etc. So the sooner you involve yourself with these people, you can validate your assumptions, you can validate your business model, and you receive valuable feedback uh, that will help you to build, uh, um, to come up with different uh, configurations uh, for your business model. So thank you very much for listening.
continuación el doctor Hola, no suena. Hola, hola. A continuación, el doctor Varela presentará las preguntas formuladas al doctor Costa por la audiencia. Doctor Costa, you need translation? No, no, no. You need translation, doctor Costa? Translation, one, two, three, testing. Yeah. One, two, three, testing. Sergio. Eh, congratulations, Sergio. Eh, la primera pregunta the first question aquí dice lo siguiente. says as follows. En algunos casos, In some cases, el cambio de modelo de empresa the change of the entrepreneurial model is something that in some cases the entrepreneur doesn't realize how these events were managed in your research I'll work. Um, so I'll try to understand in Spanish. Eh, no le funcionó, no le funcionó. Los cambios de modelo ocurren sin que el empresario los impulse. Simplemente vienen de pronto de afuera. ¿Cómo se manejó esa situación en la investigación? ¿Cómo? How did I work How out? Did you manage, uh, that, that kind of ¿Cómo manejó usted esta situación? Ok, so, so in my, in, in my study, um, As, as, I, as I told you, I try to follow uh, how the business model changes over time independently of the fact that these changes occur from the will of the entrepreneur or from the external environment. So I gathered both changes. Uh, So I didn't have to do much really. I just had to capture the changes and as and ask the, the, the entrepreneur, why did this happen? And you, you will tell me, uh, and they told me, you know, this happened because I was following my plan, or this happened because something else occurred that I was not expecting. So uh, what I did in my study was that I tried to register all the changes that occurred and all the causes y of those changes. So uh, I gather both the, the what, what is the change, Tanto how, how did it occur, cambio, and why, what was the cause qué? for this change. Eh, la causa de so when you're doing this, Cuando you are capturing changes esto, that are triggered by the desire of the entrepreneur por, or eh, triggered by the external Could you explain what type of incentives had the university that was examined to have these spin-offs in the university? What type of incentives? The question is because in Colombia there are very few spin-offs, university spin-offs that we have. Okay. Um, so As far as I understood, it's the incentives Los for the university and not for the research. No That's correct. No, the incentive that the university no, provides the researchers so that they will, okay. become, uh, they will do the spin I think that, uh, you know, uh, what I observed being in, in a UK university is that um, I think it's not just about incentives, it's about uh, sometimes the lack of opportunities to do something else as well. So as you know, uh, there are, if we look at the UK, there are more and more 
PhD students, and uh, there is just there, there's just not enough room for everyone to be professors uh, at, at the university. So uh, uh, one avenue uh, for academics uh, who found a technology that can commercialize and to do something uh, you know, to the population. To do, uh, so uh, this is an avenue, this is a way out for, for people, for very, very highly educated people, is to, is to, to spin off and, and get involved with the industry. Um, so this is one of the, of the incentives, it's just because there's no other option. Other incentives are just, they are fed up of working as an academic and they want something more hands on, more tangible, and so they want to do something uh, that is a bit more, uh, that is a bit more useful, or it has a more effect uh, in the exterior. Um, and I, I would say these are the incentives uh, for, from uh, um, the entrepreneur's perspective. I would say these are the, the, the incentives. Also, there is a promise of getting more money than they get in the university and, uh, and being more autonomous as well. Um, so from the perspective of the entrepreneur, I would say these are the, the, the incentives. I don't know if you want me to talk about the, the, from the university perspective. Um, I, I, I think, for example, in the UK, there's just uh, more, more demand uh, to use the universities as, um, as a source of wealth for the country, uh, as a source of, of, of giving uh, uh, employment to all these uh, people with, with high levels of education. So somehow universities are at, at a bit more uh, pressured uh, to generate uh, um, spin-off companies. And, and uh, in fact, looking at the trends in the last years, uh, we realize that the number of spin-offs has been increasing quite steadily um, over the years. And also the contracts, the research contracts with the industry collaboration with the university has increased as well. And, and so has the licensing. Because licensing above all is even giving more revenues to universities than spin-offs. Next question. Next question. Okay. Um, for, uh, I, in the beginning, I, I, I didn't get quite well. They're talking about internal variables. Yes. Okay. The internal variables that produce more changes in the spin-off. Uh, well, I have to think about that. So the, the internal variables that produce uh, more changes is the desire of the entrepreneur to, to grow and the need for uh, resources and being more specific, the need for investment. So what, what is triggering a lot of changes in the business model, and this comes from internal variables, is the, the need for investment. So the, uh, these guys are really chasing, chasing money to do their, their stuff, and they need it. Uh, and so this is a huge driver. They do many many things to try and attract the investors, uh, and like setting up a good management team, so this means changing the key resources, for example. 
establishing partnerships with research institutes or, or institutions that give them credibility. So there you, there you go, you have key partners here changing. Um, they also s uh, spend the, you know, they also apply, for example, for funding. They spend a lot of time dedicated to these applications. So this becomes a huge key activity for the company to go after funding. So uh, this desire to grow uh, coupled with the need for investment, these are the internal drivers uh, that cause more changes in the business. This question has to do with the business plan. And the question asks how it integrated the prospects that the employees had with the plans of investment. Uh, yeah, entrepreneurs were uh, linked to the business plan in case they had business plans. Uh, I'm not sure I got uh, the question right. Um, could you repeat, please? Yeah. I prefer to hear. Uh, let's consider that the Consideremos companies when you get to the first interview. Do they have a business plan? Written business plan? plan? Yes. Or how that business plan was uh, merged with the prospective, with the intended idea that the entrepreneur had. Okay. So, um, most of the companies had business plans, and, um, and that, that's a, there's a quite tangible reason for that, is because they needed to uh, attract investors. So if they, if they are going to meet investors and they are going to ask for money, they have to, um, they have to show them some figures. Uh, the investors would like to see that and would like to see a bit of talk uh, about you know, their intentions, uh, all these sorts of things that you see in the business plan. And um, also, if you are applying for government grants, they will want to see as well uh, a business plan. So yes, uh, the answer is yes. There is, uh, in most cases, I'll say one of the cases didn't have it. Plan, uh, but all the other seven, they had business plans. And uh, how do they merge with the business model? Well, many of them, when they go to second rounds of investment or third rounds of investment, they review their business plans. So what happened in their business models during that time, it will be reflected in the, in the revision of the business plan. So both of them, they go hand in hand somehow. But of course, they will only do the business plan if it's required. They don't need it for themselves. How these companies were able to be de las more, to have a commitment of the individuals commitment in the process of changes in these businesses. Um, so the, the compromise um, of these people, which people exactly? A, a, a que personas se Managers, compromiso additional people that have decided to get involved really para que se in terms of development of new business models. Okay. So f f first of all, you know, most of the changes that are occurring here they are not really big changes. They are quite incremental changes. Uh, so there is not really a big revolution and, and things uh, change, you know, quickly over, overnight. Uh, it's like um, steady steps that they are giving. So uh, I, I don't really, I don't really, I think the people, the person or the commitment is within somehow the team, not the business model somehow. I think the commitment is around the team, around the people. And uh, so if we have to try another customer segment, then we try. I think uh, people are already committed by default because it's the commitment to the company, not really to the business model uh, or the fact that the business model is changing, if you, if you know what I mean. 
So, no sé, sí, eh, um, sí, claro, mi respuesta. I don't think that the business model no change uh, creates any perturbation in the commitment of, of, of people. Uh, that's the way I see it from this los investigadores y los académicos generalmente están muy concentrados en sus investigaciones y poco en lo empresarial. ¿Cómo se orienta o se acompaña a un investigador para que éste decida hacer el paso de ser empresario? Esa es una pregunta muy um, there's, there's many different cases. Um, there are companies in which the CEO is the main academic that, uh, that research, uh, that made the research, that created the technology. In other companies, uh, the CEO, so the, the general manager, is not uh, the, the, the guy who discovered the, the the technology, but it's what they call a surrogate entrepreneur, someone who comes from the outside, and sometimes this is through the technology transfer office uh, networks, uh, or in business meetings, or in academic meetings where they are exposing their technologies. What happens is sometimes there is an interest of someone which is not an academic, it's a non-academic, with many years of experience in managing small companies or creating companies. And uh, this guy becomes then the CEO of the company, and usually the academic becomes the chief scientific officer or the chief technology officer. Uh, so in some of the companies, the academic assumes an executive role like the general manager, and in some companies, he doesn't assume because he just wants to continue to do his research and teaching career. Uh, so I have examples of, of both. And, and there's, I think there's no way to force them into, into whatever. They have to decide by themselves what they want to do with their lives. And then if they, want, they, they, if they don't want to leave the company, then the solution is to get a surrogate entrepreneur, which will increase somehow the managerial and entrepreneurial knowledge of the team, which is highly interesting as well, and it's a good way for success. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much.